and uh, welcome, welcome. I put um, some questions in the chat box and I am inviting you to pop in and tell us, tell us who you are. And, you know, how do you say who you are in just a couple lines, but for the sake of ease and for alignment, because that's what we're playing a game of today, is I'd love to hear your name or place it in the chat. Um, tell us where you're beaming in from, where are you beaming in from? Um, and if this is your first time or your 10th time, tell us, you know, like how long have you been in this world of, of sacred storytelling? And then um, also, just like, is there something specific that's bringing you here? This is the moment to shape this class according to your own interests. You get to you get to um, really be a, an author, you know, participate in authoring our co-creative experience today. So if there's something specific that you are looking for, if you came with a story that you really want to change, then um, do tell because there's going to be an opportunity to play later on. So, um, okay, uh, David, I know, uh, oops, David Garner sent me, says Suzanne, and welcome, welcome, and hello from LA, and hello, Genesis, a fellow storyteller in LA, and this is your first time, wonderful, I'm ready to share my stories, okay, and how to transmute pain. Yeah, let's get into that. And welcome Shell from Monterey in Tahoe and um, loving stories and finding myself telling part of negative stories not being better. Yeah. And for those of you who are just joining, um, I'm really inviting you just to pop in. If you can place yourself on video and if you can be radically fully present for our time, we, we are in a, a co-creative space. And I'm going to go, we're, we're going to go on a big journey today, and you're going to have an opportunity to do some digging into your own stories. And so the best, most generous gift you might be able to give yourself today is to be really present so that you have time and space for your stories to reveal, to emerge, and maybe, I got no, I have no day, maybe even a shift could happen, you know, so that's that's the game that we're playing today so good to see so many of you hello ada wait wait i know you had a line <laughs> and uh suzanne and david what a beautiful familiar face and hello diana welcome zahira welcome dana hello is it howie hi howie and aura good to see you again and hi shell and constance good to see you again and pamela and lisa cohen and gosh, and then a lot of people on video. So, um, okay, so there's some driving. David's here to play with the story of climate change. It's one of my favorite stories to play with. Um, Anna's not, she's not going small. She's coming in from Sweden and uh, curious to learn more about narratives and storytelling and limiting stories of class, scarcity, loss, and abandonment. You're going all in, I love it. And um, okay. Shall we begin? Let's begin. I really want to invite you to take a moment to look around. Look around this room. And if you can put yourself on gallery view for a moment and just take a look at who you're going to go on this adventure with. Storytelling is it's a, it's a collaborative sport. It happens through connection. If you're one of those people that's gotten stuck telling yourself stories, I've been one of them, you know how crazy making that can become. And storytelling is designed to be done together. And what happens when we enter into the space of doing it together, we enter into one of the oldest ways of being together through this kind of connection. And it comes through our heart, it comes through our resonance, it comes through our minds, it comes through our intentions, and it comes through our animal bodies, you know, and, and we can't lie from the space. We feel each other. We know each other through how we feel each other. And that's why I want to give you an opportunity to put yourselves on video. Look around at these people who are saying, yes, I want to live in a world where the oldest, most ancient tool on the planet is recognized and used responsibly. 
I, I um, wanted to come in today and one of the things I love, I always, I take you all for a walk before I can begin these classes. You know, I've got this beautiful structure and PowerPoint that I'm going to show you in just a second. But before every class, I take you for a walk and I do some deep listening for you. And I listen for like, what wants to come through today just for you? Because, you know, you all signed up, right? You, you start creating the class before we even get here. And one of the things that came through this morning was this remembering that storytelling is not a luxury. I'm just curious, is how many people I just gave away? See, this is I, I gave away the punchline, but how many people think of storytelling as a luxury? Why don't why don't we just start there? Like who here? That was such a bad setup. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say it right <laughs> but who used to think of storytelling as a luxury i'm just curious as entertainment as as that okay right you know genesis is like yeah I, I used to think of it as a luxury i used to think of it as entertainment i used to think of it as escapism you know and and i'm going to talk to you about why i don't think of it like that anymore but one of the things i really want to presence is that by the time we're done my intention is that you will be in the remembering that storytelling is your birthright. That is one of the, it, I was, I used to say it's, it used to be one, one of the most powerful tools. Now, no, it is the most powerful tool on our planet. Nothing can be created without a story. It's used to create, it's used to heal, it's used to make meaning. And we're going to go on a little adventure where you're kind of catching us halfway through. So some of you have gotten to see Lorna's been there, you know, some of you have seen the, the Diana's been there, you know, some, uh, some of you have seen David's been there. Um, the, the, the story of like, or has been there, you know, for, um, what, you know, the origin of sacred storytelling and really getting into the, what is a story. We're going to be jumping in a little bit midway today, and we're going to go into how to change a story. So let's let's get into it. I am going to share with you a, um, a PowerPoint. And if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have ideas along the way, please share them because I love making this as collaborative as possible. And uh, thank you while I get everything set up for you right now. And so here we are. We're going to dive in. How do we change a story? So, you know, I love knowing first, like, what, like, just this is a question for you. What, what are you doing here? Why are you giving an hour of your life force to this? And, you know, what the, the invitation was to change a story. So I really want to invite you to get pretty concrete right now. What stories are haunting you? What are the stories that are bothering you? What are the stories that are driving you? You know, it might be, you know, David mentioned the story of climate change. Someone else mentioned the story of scarcity. You know, you might have a story where you don't feel like you forgive yourself. You might have a, a story of unforgiveness. You know, you might have a story that there's not enough. You know, you might have not enough time, not enough resource, not enough love. You know, what are the stories? I just really want to invite you to presence that right now. Because as you hold this story in your presence, we're going to play with it. I love this, this quote. It's by Leslie Mormon Silko. Old stories and new stories are essential. They tell us who we are. They enable us to survive. We thank all the ancestors and we thank all those people who keep on telling stories generation after generation, because if you don't have the stories, you don't have anything. You know, one of the reasons why I feel so passionate and compelled to be one of those people like you who are holding the realm of stories that we are living in the era of information. And it's an extraordinary moment to be alive, the information era. No other humanity, no other, as far as we know, you know, group has had to manage this many, um, this much information coming together. But there's also something profound that's happening. If I were a storyteller, looking back on this time, and from the future, I might say, oh, it was the time of many stories happening at once. Meaning that at no other time in history have we known it, have so many people from so many cultures lived side by side, house by house next to each other. 
who are sharing different creation stories, different creation myths, different ways of seeing the world, different truths. And here we are in one of the most extraordinary times learning how to live together. It's one way of looking at our world right now. There are so many other ways. So here we are. What, what is it? What will we experience in this, in this class? So let's, let's get into like, what is a story? You know, we're also gonna get into the ethics of changing a story. We're gonna talk about three considerations that you can take into account. And then we're gonna give you some examples of how to actually change a story. But let's, let's start. Okay, who am I? Um, some of you know, I grew up on a farm. I grew up in Vermont. I also grew up moving around a lot, but part of my history is a deep connection with land. It would take me many, many years, about three decades, to understand that my connection to land and my connection to story are woven into each other and deeply related. I thought they were separate growing up. I started to learn the responsibility of storytelling at a very young age. I got involved with professional theater and I was very lucky in the sense that I had parents that spotted my gifts, they spotted my talents, and they encouraged them. I got to go to professional theater school at a very young age. I got hand-selected for a professional theater company, and I went straight into the world of theater in New York City at the age of 18. But before that, I had something um, happen, a massive crisis when I was in my teenage years when my best friend committed suicide. And the, the way of approach where I lived was to ignore it, to keep on going. And yet, if you've lost someone you know, there's no, you don't, you, there's no keeping on going. And especially when you lose someone your own age, that young, you know, and especially when you lose someone to suicide. And so I went to that place that had always been my sanctuary, which was storytelling. And for the first time, I wasn't just absorbing and receiving I was creating and I was making meaning out of what was meaningless. And that process led me to create a play. That process, um, that play ended up winning a role at a place in a playwriting festival. And from there, I got to understand the responsibility of storytelling. Because what I learned was that what you put out comes back. And while I shared my grief, then other people brought their grief to me. It was one of the most powerful lessons I understood as what it means to be a conscious creator and the responsibility for what you create. I learned the business of storytelling as I studied professionally in New York City, went on to summer stock, worked off Broadway. I ended up coming into one of the other most powerful lessons in my life, which was that good intentions is not enough. And I learned that when I, when I started working for Al Gore at his television network. I was working the dream job for me because I had this simple intention. I wanted to be in a place of protecting the planet. I wanted to be part of the changing story, the changing narrative that we could actually, at that time I thought it was save the world, you know, save the earth. And what I learned was that good people with good intentions can cause great harm if they don't understand how storytelling works. And that how storytelling works is different than what drives us to click or drives us to watch. And that I learned that the intention of the storyteller is paramount. And that we are as responsible as listeners for what we receive and what we catch than what we tell. And that being a fully storied person means that that link between what we hear, what we receive, what we allow to live inside of our consciousness is just as meaningful and important as what we choose to tell. I also learned something else while I was working at Current TV that, um, that I thought that if we, we told people, you know, the information that led them to inspiration, activation, motivation, no, people don't pay attention to information as much as we thought, that it was stories that people will watch them, they will receive them, and they will act on the story. And that one of the most important things we could do is give people a role to play in the big stories of our time. When I learned that, it gave me the key out of the media world, and it gave me the key into the realm of story. And I started teaching with people 
uh, and I started creating um, small classes in the woods is where it started. Uh, David was in one of my first classes in Kauai. And it turned out that, um, that the, the more classes that we taught, the more guest teachers we started to bring in, the larger the classes that got, and, and it just kind of took over. It took over a lot of my life, to be honest. And now it's not just classes, it's a whole school for sacred storytelling. And we started to realize that something happens when we're together, that change can happen much faster when we're doing it together. And that, um, that kind of sense of being in community, being such a paramount part of storytelling, is part of what leads me to you today. So let's get into this idea of, you know, that storytelling stories are often consciousness made visible. It's one way of looking at it, you know. When we look at, you know, what is a story? Um, you know, we can say, you know, a story is a lot of different things. Um, and I'd like to ask, I'd like to, you know, invite you right now, just let's, let's get in on this. What, what is it? What is a story? Can you put it in the chat box for a few moments, you know, just in terms of what does it mean to you, this thing of story? And also, if you want to put in the chat box, what is it? What's your role as a storyteller? I love seeing Aura think about this. What is her role as a storyteller? She's really doing it. You know, this is why we keep our videos on, because we inspire each other. Okay. So I'm gonna pop in and, and look at your chat and your at your chats to see what's coming alive over there in this conversation. Um, so it's what we're seeing over here is that um, stories like right, they connect us, says Isabella. A story, says Marilyn, is providing connections and lessons. Yes, says Marilyn. Veronica saying it's a snapshot of our lived experience. Sherry saying it's a narrative giving a view of reality or a possible reality. Laura saying a story is a sounding into being what is and what is becoming. A sounding, right? So we're speaking about resonance. You know, Pamela saying that's sharing information, but also the life behind it. And I love that, you know, Pamela saying, oh, but there's life in our stories. You know, or is saying that they're, we're sharing our personal experience. One of the things I love is that we can give these transmissions, right? You know, uh, James can have a, a very rich experience. He can, he can, you know, I'm just going to tease you, sharing, uh, tease you a little bit, James. He can, like we all do, you know, make a mistake here or there. But how he tells the story defines how he lives the story and defines who he becomes as a wisdom keeper. Right? And, and all of a sudden, his life becomes a gift that he can give. And, and the, so there's this transmission where I don't have to make the same mistake when I get to learn from someone else. That's why I love stories. Um, uh, or saying that they're sharing personal experience. Lisa saying, my role as a storyteller is to stimulate compassion and action. Compassionate action. I love that. Isn't that a clear sense? You know, when, when Lisa gets up to tell her stories, she doesn't even have to say that, right? It's so strong in her resonance. But it's just going to come through the space. James says, making sense of what's happening in our life, right? That's what a story is. Shell's saying, being authentic. Um, uh, David's saying, resonance of mirror neurons, right? So it's like there is this thing that's happening. And we'll talk a little bit about that. A story is a way of teaching. Right? It becomes a mirror for our collective, says Genesis. So there's so many ways that we can talk about what is a story. And we're talking a lot today about what does a story do, right? You know, one of this thing about mirroring the collective is that in ancient times, it was said that, you know, when the storyteller came through, if a child was misbehaving and wasn't listening or was distracting, um, they weren't reprimanded. Something much worse. They were ignored. And that was considered the ultimate punishment from the storyteller, not to be acknowledged or seen. Now think about our modern day media and how it acts as the storyteller for the collective. And what is it if you don't see yourself represented? What, if it, what is it if you don't see yourself as part of the story? And what does that do to your own sense of self? Um, you know, one of the ways that we can look at story is that it's an operating system and it, and it teaches us, 
in terms of um, how to see the world. It guides us in terms of how to understand the world. It guides us in terms of understanding our beliefs, our values, what roles we should play. But stories also do something much bigger. They're a library of the soul. And the story that we tell can be so much larger than the, the information of our human experience. It can become the journey of a soul that's so much bigger. And what happens when you start to talk about your, your story from that place? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Okay, a sacred story is, I'm going to, usually we do a big long thing on this, but I'm just going to cut to the chase right now. A sacred story, it's something that has, you know, when we employ this language sacred, we're saying, I see the life inside of you. I see that you have your own energy body, your own energy form. Stories are, you know, in the most mystical sense, these very mysterious beings, right? There's an energy in them. When I tell a story, you can feel it. When we, hear, when we hear a sacred story, you know, I think of what is a sacred story? It's a story in service to life itself. So all of a sudden I receive a sacred story and I'm like, ah, I got some wisdom. I, got, I feel better about myself. I believe in humanity. I believe all things are possible. I've gotten some energy. Life is good. You know, Genesis knows what I'm talking about. Diana knows what I'm talking about. You know, it's like you want to get up the next morning, do 10 extra push-ups. you know? No, but um, what is a zombie story? The zombie story sucks the energy out. It creates separation. It creates othering. It's, it's in destruction of life. It spreads fear. You know, and sometimes as a human being, we can literally just look at this. A sacred story can take you into the depths of the, and, and show you, remember that mirroring that we talked about? Show you the horrors of humanity so that you can learn from it. But a sacred story is a guide it will bring you back out and give you the tools and ways of living in this world in a good way. So a sacred story will never abandon you in the horrors of life. So I really want to invite you, if nothing else from this class, to be empowered in how you walk through the world in determining what you allow to take up valuable real estate in your consciousness. What stories will you give life to and allow into your space and allow them to continue walking through how you tell them and retell them. Um, now, I'm gonna go back to our screen. Thank you for uh, that. Okay, so, and now as a, as a role of a storyteller, you know, in, in ancient uh, Welsh, the role of the storyteller was to be a guide, it was literally to walk between the dimensions. And then they do something else that I want to talk, you know, stories do something else. They give us access to the unseen world. Do you know that Einstein said that when he was trying to learn something that he didn't understand, he went into the realm of story. That it was entering into the imaginal place that he could gain access to more things than he could understand in the human plane. And that in the, in, in the Kabbalah tradition, it was, it was understood as a secret teaching that your imagination give you access to God. That was considered a secret. So this is where I want to say, hey, this, this, this thing that has been kind of pushed off the side is entertainment and escapism. It's a tool that might be being mishandled and misused. But it's one of our basic rights as humans to understand this tool, understand how to use this tool, understand how to use it as a tool and not as a weapon. So as we started talking about, it gives us a, a, this opportunity to journey into the temple of your soul. And they travel, the terrain that they travel is through our consciousness. And once they get in, that can be hard to get out. So this is why it's so important to have your sacred storytelling goggles, these things that you can see you know, so you don't have to be afraid of, oh, don't tell me that, you're going to lower my vibe. No, no, no. You're so much stronger than that. You can just watch the stories go by and determine which ones you will take in. So five things to take into consideration. You know, if you want to change a story, this is a story of climate change. This is a story of heartbreak. If this is a story of what you can and can't do, what, what is possible for you to do in this lifetime, you know, these are all different stories. This is why it's really helpful to have a sense of what story you want to change. 
Five things you want to take into consideration. The source. Where does the story come from? Who was its creator? Some of us inherit stories. We just, they just, they, they come in through the bloodline. Some of us inherit them through, this, through our family. Some of them receive us, receive them through television, you know. So it's like, you want to know who was creating your story and what was your intention. We had such a beautiful example um, of a woman who said, this is my intention, you know, compassion, compassionate action. I want to inspire that through my stories, right? I want to listen to stories from that person, you know. Um, I want to be aware of if the person that's telling my story is trying to profit off of me. I want to know if they're trying to separate something. I want to know if they're in service to life. That's why you want to know the source of the story. You want to know who's creating it and why. What are they in service to? Sometimes that one simple thing can just like start to crack and, and, and break away um, stories that aren't in service to you. You want to understand the bones of the story. What are they made of? You know, what is your story made from? You know, knowing what your story, you know, your author is in, in service to, um, to really understand a story. You know, maybe this is a fairy tale, you know, or an old story. What couldn't be said when that story was written? This is a really fun example, the story of Medea. Who, who here knows the story of Medea? Are we, do we know that? The story of Medea really quickly, ancient Greek myth. Uh, we know it as, you know, Jason was off to see the golden, catch the golden fleece. He met Medea, this wild witch that lived in the wilderness, who was very, very powerful. They fell in love. Medea used her power to help him gain, you know, all the strength that he needed to get the golden fleece. She killed her own relatives to help them. She did all kinds of things. They fell in love, they got married, they had kids. She was no longer that wild witch out in the wilderness. Oh, so the story goes, Jason fell in love with someone else. It was about power. You know, he met a king, the king was like, hey Jason, you're so powerful now, I can give you more power. Marry my daughter, you're gonna get more land. Before Jason could come back, or it got back to Medea. So the story goes, the fury that rose in her about being a woman betrayed destroyed the king, his daughter, and, so the story goes, her own children as revenge. And this is a very powerful story because what does it do is it, it paints the, the powerful feminine as very dangerous. What they create, they can destroy. Now, when you go back to research that story, it was written by Euripides. And these old stories, these ancient myths, we think of them as fiction now, but at the time they were reporting in on the truth of the day. This was how their newspapers went about. And the, the, the story of how that was created was that Euripides, the playwright, was hired by the villagers of the king who was murdered to rewrite the story to say that Medea killed her children because history says that actually the villagers killed her children as revenge, and then paid to have the story written in a different way. Isn't that wild? When Euripides wrote that play, which he was paid to do, he was all, then banished because no one had shown a woman being that powerful in a story before. So it's a great example of the complexity of stories and how a story like that, going through time, has had great impact and great influence on um, how the feminine is viewed. And to truly understand it, you gotta know the history. You have to know what could and it couldn't be said. Um, you also wanna know, like, what does the story have to say for itself? This is a really important thing. What universal wisdom is living inside that story? This is a bigger topic. We can't we can't unfold Medea fully right now. We could spend a whole, you know, a couple of hours on that. But when you are approaching your story, there it's it is um, it is like approaching any elder. You don't go up to it and say, "Ah, your clothes are so old-fashioned. I'm going to change. Let, let's let's pull off that jacket and get rid of that hat and redo your hair." I mean, if you went up to somebody like that, they'd hit you in the face. 
right? You know, get off me. Same thing with our stories, especially our elder stories. We've got, to, we've got to appreciate that there must be some real strength in them to be still alive. Okay, so they've got to have some power in them. And so if we're, if we're saying, hey, 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 just because you're an older doesn't mean that you're acting like an elder in our society. Maybe it's time to grow up. Maybe it's time to evolve. And if that's the case, if you want to approach an old story like that, then first you've got to listen to it. And you have to understand that it's here for a reason. It has something to share. And so first you got to be in, in a humble respect and listen. What is the universal wisdom that's living in the story? Now, if we want to change a story, let's look at the climate narrative. So let's see. What are some of the key messages that you are currently seeing? I'll come back to the chat. What are some of the current messages that you are seeing in our climate change, the story of climate change right now. And while you start to put in those key messages that you're getting, I'll just mention the distinction between a narrative and a story, a real climate change story. It's not a story, it's a narrative. A narrative is, it, it, it points us in a direction, it tells us to go there. Um, just do it. You know, that's a great example of a narrative, you know, from Nike, it tells us what to do. So I'm gonna come down, let's see, what are some of the, the things that we're seeing? So Lauren is saying in that narrative, there's fear. Um, anything else, you know, I, I can't help enough, says Dana, right? It's too little, too late, says Isabella. This is a bummer of a narrative. You know, what else are we seeing? Blame, oh yeah, there's lots of blame. It's a narrative that makes me feel overwhelmed and powerless, right? Veronica is saying humans mess it up. We may not be able to reverse it. It's a powerful story. Individual versus collective insanity, right? You know, this is a story that in, in terms of the narrative of climate change, in terms of how it's being spoken right now, we're looking at something that is, you know, taking the energy out, right? It's separating us. It's filling our world with shame and blame. You know, it's filling us with scarcity. Uh, right, Genesis, oh, we're victims. Things are not in our control, right? This is not an empowering, this is not a sacred story. This is not a story in service to life, which is kind of mind blowing, right? When you think of all the people that are spreading the narrative, and I used to be one of them, who really do come with the intention of being in service to life. Right? And so this is where this idea of what it means to be a powerful, so powerful to be a conscious creator, we have to understand how stories work. The thing about stories, one of the things I love this line is that um, you might not know the old stories, but the old stories know you. Leslie Mormon Silco said that. And that in the same way, you might not speak the language of story. And sport story does not speak English, doesn't speak French, probably speaks Greek. But basically, the language of story is symbol, metaphor, archetype. It's actual universal. And so whether or not you speak the language of story, that language is still being spoken. So one of the things, you know, if we want to play with that narrative, well, this, 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 the, the story of climate change, you know, it's like, well, first of all, let's start picking apart and looking at it, you know, from that lens, you know, okay. So first of all, one of the strangest things about the story, who ca the casting agent needs to be fired. Who cast a change is the bad guy. Now, now look, I'm not arguing that our planet has got a bunch of stuff that's going on and like that we're in a situation that we've got to tend to it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing climate science. Okay, I'm inviting you to go into um, a metaphorical conversation, which is how stories speak to us. What is a metaphor? It's the language of spirit and how does speak, spirit speak to us? It speak to us through our stories. And so when we look at, and for instance, one of, the, one of the biggest issues I have with this narrative is that they cast change as the bad guy and change is Earth's essence. She is an evolutionary being. Her nature is to change. So already we have a language issue. 
or somewhere in the, the collective consciousness, we've been planting the idea that change is bad. That's so weird, right? When it's our evolution, we want our stories to change because just like trees, we want our trees to grow up so they can cast a great big canopy. Have you guys stood next under a big tree recently? Has anyone gotten to do that? Oh my gosh, next time you have a chance, go stand underneath a big tree and think about what would it feel like if your stories felt like that? Because they're so big and they're so generous and their arms are outstretched. And oh, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> and so like when you when we when we're living in big stories, we create a canopy of protection for other people to live under. And that's what we can do as storytellers. Our stories can protect other people. Our stories can be infused with love, care, vision. And so when we infuse that into our stories, look at what we're giving to people. Here's just an, another um, slight example. I, I got to speak to, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name. In my mind, stories often live longer and stronger than people's names. So please forgive me for this for this massive character flaw. But I got to meet with this um, beautiful man who was 94 at the time. Actually, I met him in Kauai many years ago, David. And he was one of the oldest um, Holocaust survivors at the time. He was a dentist. So if you ever search dentist Kauai Holocaust survival, you'll find him. And he was so joyful and delighted in life, just totally happy. You know, it's like it was so, you know, I was having so much cognitive dissonance. I was like, how could someone have gone through so much horror and be so happy? And, you know, he was telling us his story of how he'd escaped and all these different things. And, um, and we were asking him, like, how did you do it? Like, how did you, how did you do it? And he said, well, my parents, my parents always told us that they loved us. That we were the most valuable things in the world. And there was nothing that Hitler could say that could break that story. So simple. He had actually said that his parents had just blessed him. And I was like, oh, is this a formal thing? Do they sit down with you and bless you? He's like, no, no, no. They just told us that they loved us and that we were, that we were incredibly valuable. You know, so it's, it is one of those things that we can do every day, just walking by anybody, walking by strangers. You know, every time we're around people that we love, you know, understanding that our power, our words are so powerful and they can protect others and moments that we can't even imagine right now. And so when we come back to, right, Lisa saying they, right, they can give voice to the voiceless. Um, you know, so when we come back to this idea of this, you know, this climate narrative, you know, and that it's got these very strange messages, and one of them is that people are bad. Well, wait a second here. People are amazing, and you know it. We're incredibly creative. We're incredibly innovative. Systems, some of the systems that we're living in isn't working. There are people who are exhibiting massive amounts of greed. Greed is bad. Greed is different than people. So words matter. And how we perpetuate this and how we take the time to go really in and pay very close attention to the messages and to what's being spread is so important. So again, you've got to ask, what is this, what is this narrative in service to? You know, if it's shutting you down, filling you with blame, filling you with shame, your creative imagination, your creative muscles are not engaged and your most amazing capacity of being a human, problem solving and a creator has been turned off. You know, this, the, when we engage ourselves as storytellers, we are turned on. Our creative activity is, is turned on. Our channel to get access to wisdom and insight, our genius gets turned on. So this is why I want to invite you constantly to be looking around and paying attention. If something is turning you off, if something is turning off your imagination and it's turning off your optimism, is turning off your, your believing, your, you believing that you have the capacity to have authority over your life, to author your life, then put in your sacred storytelling goggles and start looking at, you know, these key pieces. So, you know, we just talked about a fear-based narrative versus a love-based narrative, you know, and like, who do you want to be? What are the messages that you want to give our next generation? I've got two nephews downstairs right now. It drives me crazy that they're being raised in a time of so much fear. 
You know, how can we play a role in these young people in seeing that this world is incredible and the future has not been defined, that we are the builders and creators of it every day when we are so radically present in terms of filling this time with a vision of what we want to see tomorrow. So how do you change a story? Um, this is a different kind of thing. Okay, so we, we took the climate narrative, right? We took that big climate thing, okay, and then we're putting it to the side. Now, what if somebody's just driving you crazy? What if you've got a bad guy that's shown up in your life, a villain? What if somebody's betrayed you? Or um, has, has caused great harm? You know, what do you do in this case? So in this case, I want to teach you the sumo wrestler flip. This is one of my favorite games to play. And I learned this about as honestly as one can. I was going through a massive betrayal. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I go through big hard times, I can get stuck in the story. And the story will just go round and round. Does anyone else deal with this? The story just goes round and round. It's sort of like a little racetrack. It just keeps going and going. And then, and then the more you repeat it, the, the more you under, know it. And you say, start saying the same lines over and over again. That's, that's my first indicator that, that something is, is wrong. Right? If our stories aren't growing, our, our stories want to grow and change, just like we want to grow and change. If we're stuck saying the same story over and over again, all of a sudden you know that some part of your consciousness got stuck. Because what we want our stories to do is we want them to be able to change. We're no longer the person that the story happened to. We are changed because of it. So that's one of the great quick indicators. Is there a story in your life that you keep telling over and over again the exact same way? So one of the things that you want to do is you want to change the role. Okay, you, that there's a couple of rules. You've got to be willing. Are you ready? To not be right. Can you be willing to not be right? Just to see a little raise of hands. Okay, I see some hands, great, okay. So that means that you're willing to have a humble mind. You're willing to be inspired. You're willing to be, to see things in a way that you've never seen them before. Now look, you can't lie about this stage of where you are. Sometimes we're not, we're just not, you know, and that's okay, hopefully you'll get through it. You'll go work it out and you'll, you'll move through that part of the journey. But, but when you're at this point, you're saying, okay, I'm willing to see this in a different way. I've, I've felt the anger. I don't want to feel the anger anymore. I want to get to another stage of it. I want to play another role. I don't want to be the victim of this story. I want to find another way into another true way of living through this story. Now what we do is we do a couple of different things. First, we go on framing. What, well, how do we look at the story? If you look at the story of like, oh boy, me, life sucks. You know, well, okay, that's, gonna, that's, that's not very fun. It happens. You know, look, things happen. But who do you become because of it? And so when we look at the story and we say, okay, you've been initiated by life. You must be ready for some big lesson. You're being initiated by life. Okay. And now when you say I'm being initiated by life, now all of a sudden you understand that you're in a threshold. And when you're at a threshold of initiation, you understand that some part is going to have to stop. You're going to have to stop hating somebody. You're going to have to stop being right. You're going to have to change, change your role in the story. And one of the quickest ways to change your role is to change the role of the other person. You ready? This is for brave, wild souls. You're going to take the person that's been cast in your story as the villain. You're going to take them. You're going to flip the story upside down, inside out. You're going to recast them as your master teacher. Your master teacher who on the soul level, okay, I'm not saying that what they did in the human side, I'm, I'm not validating. I, I'm not saying it's okay. We're not doing spiritual, uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> evacuation. I'm not saying that. You know, it's like there are things in the human dimension that have to be faced, but there's also that something happening on your soul level. When you say, okay, if they're my master teacher and they've come into my life to teach me, uh, to give me an opportunity to learn something that no one else is willing to help me learn. I just saw Alma speak a while ago in New York City, and uh, if you don't know who she is, she's, she's considered to be a living saint. And someone said, asked her, what's the role of a master teacher? And she said, a master teacher, their role is to show us our weaknesses. So what if this, this person who was in your story as a villain 
is now you got to be brave you got to be bold to be willing to do this to completely look at them a different way and be like well what if how is their soul coming in service to my soul what am i have to learn in this situation what, what are they giving me an opportunity to learn that nothing else in my life is giving me maybe you need to learn boundaries maybe you need to learn to speak up for yourself maybe you need to learn how to say no maybe you need to learn how to say yes there are all these things so start looking at them as being like the santa claus oh my god they just came to give you a gift that no one willing was like they took one this and they, did, they took a big hit for the team on the human side because they look like the biggest jerk but on your soul side whoa what are they giving you got to be bold to do this and then and then to really like take the opportunity and be like oh man what are they giving me you know and then you've changed your role in the story you are no longer the victim now you've got a task you've got an initiation you've got a to-do list right because you're being given something okay now how to change a story um sleeping beauty is a great example oh gosh someday my prince will come you know it's you know the the, the story of, of you know there's, it's such a complicated story right i'm not going to go too deep into it because time is, is moving but you know you want to develop again how the ethics of changing old stories. The biggest thing is that you can't just go change them. I mentioned this before, you've got to respect them. This is a strong story. It's been living for a long time. So you first you want to develop a relationship with it. You know, just like anything that, that you want to shift and change. You know, it's like, how do you develop a relationship? You want to read every single version that you can find. So if you're going in for an old story, you want to, because they've, they've often popped up of different places around the planet, told in slightly different ways. And so you would start wanting to, again, discovering the bones, the basic structure that lives in every single story. And then you want to make that distinction between an elder and an older. Where does it have gifts to give? And where is it kind of stuck in an old consciousness? And you're saying, I know that you've got a gift to give, but you also, you know, I want to help you evolve a little bit. You gotta look for the wisdom inside of it. But then just like anything, like if you go up to you know anybody, they say, you're like, do you wanna change? You have to ask for its permission. A lot of times, if you're in this work and a story comes to you, it's because it's ready to change. It doesn't mean that you, that you still need to treat it with that respect. So the last thing I'm gonna offer you in terms of how do we change a story, I love this, you know, Harness the currents of energy you want to express consciously. It's sort of from one of our, our um, guest teachers, Marta Maria. And let's say that you are in the middle of a story and you are so stuck you can't see yourself through. You don't even know what the story is. You just know that something kind of sucks right now. And, it's, and you can't stop thinking about it. And it's, and it's just bothering you. And it's interrupting your life because every time you go for a walk or every time you go to bed or every time you wake up, there it is. You know, am I the only person that deals with this? Anyone else have a little story that, that is, that's asking to be healed through you? You know, and so when we go to this moment, you say, okay, okay. What if you could go into the realm of story and as if you could go to a pharmacy and order up the exact prescription you most desire. You know, this is what we're talking about with medicine stories and that it can come in the form of a story. Now this is an advanced process that I teach in class and it's about going into the imaginal plane. It's going in with that deep intention for healing and it's actually asking, you don't tell the story that you're in, right? What you're asking for is the energetic frequency to bring healing to the story that you're currently in, living through your human life, through a mythic story. So you get to feel the medicine for your story. Again, I'm just I'm introducing the concept to you. It's super fun and super playful. Okay, this is the last thing I'm going to share with you today. You guys are you've been in for a big ride in terms of this class, you know. But um Here's another way of looking at that in terms of the medicine story. So something happened, okay? Something happened and it interrupted your life and it caused some kind of upset. And you can't figure it all out by yourself. You know, it's like, look, we're made of earth, our whole bodies. It's, it's, it's biological material made from this earth, made from this planet, you know? And so it's like, why wouldn't we think that we need other beings to help us? You know? 
And so when we come to this moment, then one of the first stages is, is being witnessed, receiving. You know, maybe you're going through a health crisis, maybe you got into a car accident, maybe a very traumatic event happened to you. You know, and the very first thing that we need is, is to be able to say it, to speak it without being interrupted. That's called a witnessing circle, a receiving circle. And, and if you're hosting a witnessing circle for someone else, there's no interrupting. There's no asking for more information. There's no debating. It's literally there just so that person can be witnessed. Then at some point, if you're in the healing process, there's got to be engaging in that ritual piece. And this is engaging earth itself. Because we're here on Earth, we're learning from Earth, we're a part of Earth. And so why wouldn't we go to Earth to, par to be part of the role of changing the story? And what is a story, right? We talked about that it's an energetic being that's living through our material matter in our world, right? So it's like, why wouldn't we engage the, the energetics of Earth to help change and heal these stories? So it's ritual intention. It's, it's, it's bringing our intention into the physical world. So perhaps you want to release a part of it. Perhaps you want to heal it. Perhaps you want to give it to the water, give it to the fire, release. You know, some aspect, if we want to change the story and heal the story, that aspect of ritual is so meaningful. Then there's the release. There's the play. There's the engage in the imagination. There's a commitment to say, okay, I want to tell a bigger story. I don't want to just go through the facts and information of what happened to me on the human side. Now I want to go in and grab the story of my soul, of a long, of a being that's on a long journey. And when we do that, we take that piece that's happened and we put it into the mythic dimension. That's where we put it into the imaginary plane and we ask the story to tell us about it through symbol, metaphor, and archetypes. So this is some of the stuff that we get into in these classes. You know, I don't expect anyone just to go off and do this, but you know, it's just introducing these concepts and the ideas. This is one of the ways that we can invite real, tangible, concrete change in our lives through this kind of process. So the last thing, oh, I guess I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I keep thinking that was the last thing, but there's one more thing, you know, and this is really fun, is that um, another way that you can look at your story is you can say, well, what about what's the energy that's living in this story? You know, in ancient Greece, they really understood that energy, they gave them the name of characters. You know, you know, love was known as Eros. You know, we, that's a really famous one. But did you know that, you know, um, that sleep was known as hypnos? You know, that rage was a character, that youth was a character. You know, that, that even justice was a character that can be understand through personification. And so when we, we can also look at our own stories and we'll say, well, where is love living in my story? Is it living as a character that's always evasive? Or is it a story where there's more than enough of love all around? You know, so it's another way of being able to examine how you're living in your story is when you can personify and give these different energies a character that they're playing in your story. So um, I'm just going to check our time. Does anyone have a story that they want to be bold with? Does anyone have a story that they're trying to make sense of and want to play with for a moment? You don't have to, but if you do, we can we can do a little interactive bold game. So if anyone has a story that they want to play with, you can put it in the chat box. Oh, okay. can you let me let's see? Let's just kind of get a sense of what what's in the room first. We're only going to have a moment to check. Um, and what I'll also say is I know that we're coming up on, on the hour. I'm going to finish this with you guys. And then I'm also going to introduce you to the School for Sacred Storytelling. And if for some reason you aren't able to stay and you've got to hop off, I just want to give you um, this link. And it's going to help you get more information right away. So meanwhile, does anyone have a story that you want to play with? Um, I'm asking you to put it into the chat box just because I want to see all the different stories and then I just want to have a sense of what's there and that way I can, I can figure out what's going to be the best one for our time today. 
So if you have a story that you're playing with, I'm asking you to put it in the chat box. Um, okay, Lauren is dealing with feeling with guilt for ancestors who died in the camps, right? So Shelly is saying a story, a story about to warn people. Okay. Isabella is saying no, not feeling good enough. No feeling good enough. Okay. Lisa is saying caregiving my elderly mother, high maintenance, energetic. Okay. So I'm going to give a short example of a, a, Veronica, a wedding story of what it felt like to be in a prearranged marriage. A wedding, right. Marilyn's saying feeling stuck in shame from trauma. All right. So I'm just going to take one of these. I'm going to give you a couple of ways of looking at this. The story of illness and, and healing is a, versus being a victim, right? Is healing versus victim. And Diana saying a story to help me break through to my bigger expression. Okay, the story of not being chosen, right? All of such good ones. So we're just gonna play a little bit with one of them. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of ideas of ways that you can make an approach. This is designed to inspire your own thinking. This isn't the only way, okay? When we come at this, we come as playmates. We come to play, and play is actually an advanced skill that many of us didn't get to practice throughout a lot of our life. And you think about it, playing is how we learn, you know? And so when we, being able to play, it means that you can be wrong, fall on your knees, scrape yourself off and get back up and keep going. When you're playing, you're, pl you're playing with your comfort, you know, your, your comfort edges, okay? So if you're doing something that's uncomfortable, that's great. Just, what if you're just playing? So that's what we're going to do. So with Lorna, this is no small thing, feeling guilt for ancestors who died in the camps. And, and so when we look at this, we're going to look at the personification of guilt. Okay, you can, you can get really literal about the stories, but we can also, from, the, from a storied place, I'm going to invite you to like, well, who is guilt? And what I might even do is say, what is the story of guilt? You can, you can take this story in a couple of different ways, okay? So one way you could play with this, and I would, and there's probably three or four, is you can say, well, who is guilt? And what is guilt here to say? And you could even go into, what is guilt in service to? To really play it up, you can be like, well, what, what kind of shoes does, wear, does guilt wear? Does guilt wear like red high heel shoes? I don't know. Or does it wear like, you know, heavy boots? You know, what kind of outfit is guilt wearing? Is it, is it, you know, fancy or footloose or is it like something that was like, you know, got off the street somewhere in an old garbage can because it could never go buy anything new, God forbid, guilt wouldn't do that. You know, it's like, so you start having fun, you start playing with the energy of guilt. Okay, now notice what we're not doing. We're not being literal right now. Okay, we're playing in the realm of creative expression. We're unwinding the threads of the story. This is a big, heavy, tight story, right? Thickly woven by many, many people in the world. Okay, so it's like when we come into play using the story, we're, we're playing with creativity. We're inviting your sense of humor. We're inviting your play. We're, we're inviting your sacred irreverence so we can make room for awe, for a new perspective for a whole new way, because what are we trying to do? But we're trying to loosen the grip of this particular story, right? So that's one way is we can start to know guilt. You know, you can start to, you can start to actually, you know, play with guilt, get to know who it is, get to know what it has to say and ask it, you know, hey, are you in service to me? You know, what are you in service to? You know, what's your gift? What's the gift that you want to give me? Oh, you don't want me to forget. Maybe, I don't know. But are you in service to me? Like, are you in service to life? See what it wants to say. That's one way of playing with it. Another way might be, in this particular one, you might want to go towards the ancestors. You might want to open up and allow those ancestors to speak. You are a miracle. Your life is a miracle. You know, you are someone else's dream. You got dreamed into being. You know, and when we step into that, then in the storied place, you might want to allow the ancestors to have a voice. You know, you might want to give them a place to speak. So they're not being silenced by the guilt because are they able to speak when the wall of guilt is there? I don't know. 
you know, maybe you see them getting to climb this wall of guilt. I don't, I don't know what it is, but these are places and ways to play. So as you see, I'm, we're pushing at the edges, we're bringing in personification, we're letting go of our attachment to knowing the story as it is, and we're allowing it to open and expose us to wildly new perspectives and ways of being in relationship to it. It's a brave soul that takes this on, okay? It's not for the weak of heart to change your story, especially if it's if it's haunting you. A lot of these stories are really powerful, you know. So um, the challenge of the seeming insurmountability needs to be flipped. Yes. <laughs> okay. So here we are. We have come to the end of this part of our journey. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, if you if you've kind of gotten a little bit like, hmm, I'm I'm curious about what's next. How else can I play? This is what we're about to go do. We're about to go on a very playful, fun journey. And I'm going to introduce to you one of my favorite places on the planet to play, which is in the School for Sacred Storytelling. And um, this is a program that's been around since 2017. Um, and it started off literally with just like four or five people sitting around uh, in, in the forest learning about stories. And the, at first, when I first started teaching these classes, I literally just said, oh, we're just going to do storytelling. And after you know, a couple of classes, I realized that people were kind of getting mad at me. And they were like, Leah, what the heck? That was so much more than storytelling. You know, that wasn't just writing and creativity. There's something way much more that's happening here. And so that's what I'm here to talk, tell you about, the way much more of what's happening. And when we were creating this, it's like, you know, School for Sacred Storytelling, right? What is it to be a part of stories that are here to serve life itself and to be a creator of that? You know, we've been around since 2017. This is actually outdated. I've had over 50 guest teachers come in, probably over 1,500 learners have come into our space and really learning about the power of story and how it's one of the most powerful tools on our planet and how to use it um, uh, in a way that serves all beings, but mostly also how to, how to tell stories in a way that gives us more access to more of our life force, more of our energy, more of our true potential. The three things that we have that we do is we have these live programs, which I'm about to tell you about, that are online. We have a monthly membership where we meet three times a month. Um, we meet on the full moon and the new moon to keep us in relationship to our true nature and how to tell our stories. And then we also meet uh, for, as a, we do a creative, um, we do a creative jam where we where we create anything that you're working on. And so that is, uh, you can learn more about that on our website and I'll send you guys links afterwards. We also offer private coaching and, member, and mentorship. And I mention this because I we offer, I do something called story priestessing for people who want to do one-on-one -on -one work. You're working through a big story through your life or you're bringing a big story into life and you need help crossing that threshold. Um, but also, I'm not always the perfect person for you. And I happen to know this amazing group of over 50 teachers and I love playing matchmaker if I'm not the perfect person for you. Um, I gave you that link and I'm going to give it to you again in just a moment in terms of if you think that you want some guidance in telling this, what I'll do is you can sign up right now. I'll send you a discount code. You're going to get 10% uh, off our program. Um, plus, I'm going to give you a bonus of four classes that uh, people pay for. I'm going to give you a free bonus, a free, a free link to these four classes. And it's really going to give you skills in terms of how to engage story to activate your human powers. You know, and it's like your superhuman powers. Um, and what gets me excited in my own life and in others is how do we live like the really to what we came here to be what we came here to do, the greatest expression of what we are. And, you know, one of the things that I love is that, you know, these, the people that have come here, they've come to really say, how do I live in my greatest, biggest story? And Alana was talking about that it, it sparked a massive explosion of inspiration in her life. She went on to write a book. She ran for city council. I mean, Alana was on fire, you know. Um, Gil, who works in the world, world of sustainability, he said that he really noticed that his voice started changing in his work world. He was already using it, but do, going through this kind of process helped it change, helped him gain more confidence. Um, 
Lushanda, she was, she, I love this, I was able to work with my own real life story in an empowered way that helped me bring closure to an old trauma. If I had to do it over again, I'd choose coming over a thousand times more. I love that. And then, oh my gosh, Alora. She said, I finally found my true voice, which has transformed my life in ways I never thought imaginable. Alora was, a, Alora was um, an animator for, uh, some, uh, for um, I can't remember it, but it's a show that a lot of people know about. And she uh, went on, she has had an absolute brilliance in how to show mental health issues through characters and through story. And she started working with teens that were dealing with depression and giving them a creative outlet and another language for understanding themselves. It's so phenomenal what she did. And it's such a delight that, you know, to be part of it. So what we're up to right now is the alchemy of story. And this program it begins September 24th is when we launch. It's five six-week creative intensives. We meet on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. And the journey is these five different modules. The first one, it's, you know, what starts in September, it's getting to the bones, you know, like we got to start the, the foundation. And our foundation is understanding your own lineage stories, the stories that made you, the stories from your family, knowing the origin stories of the land that you live on, and knowing how to access and tell your own story from a soul perspective. So that's what we're getting into. You can say that we're, you can see we're not playing small over here. We'll take a couple of weeks off, then we'll dive back in. And this time we're telling wisdom stories. And the wisdom stories, you know, like we crafted with that sumo wrestler move, we're going in for the stories that are disrupting life. These are, these are major life incidences that have, that have created some kind of upset and we're looking at how to gain the most amount of power from them. And that's, that's how do we find the gifts that are in them? How do we find the wisdom? How do we become wisdom keepers because of them? Then we take a couple weeks off, have a holiday, and we go in for the medicine stories and talk a little bit about that before. How do you learn how to work with story as a tool for healing? How do you access story for healing? How do you give other people stories for healing? And really look at it from that, that perspective. And then we're going in for the alchemy of change. This is how do you tell your vision stories, your teaching stories. How do you really, this, this module really focuses on using your voice out in the world. And then our final one is story as ceremony. And it really examines who you are as a conscious creator. I love this module. I'm going to tell you why I love this module, because I've never seen anything like it in any other school in the world. And it really goes into the energetics that are happening in the exchange of story. So how do we protect you as a storyteller? How do you protect yourself from projections? How do you manage energetic fields? These are all things that we're doing every time we tell story. So it's a way of looking at um, the lens through that. This is an, an example we have over uh, I think 35 storytellers that and teachers and healers that are coming together. And what makes this program really unique is that you're going to see that we have professional storytellers, professional writers, um, people who are healers. And so you're going to come out with an alchemy. You know, how do you alchemize your life experience into powerful stories? And in so doing so, finding much more life force power in your own life. And so, you know, one of the ways that you know, it, it's, it's, I gotta tell you guys, it's so hard for me to explain what we do in the space. You know? <laughs> My joy is in like being in there. When we're in classes, I don't ever talk this much, you know, David knows that. You know, it's much more about like being, you guys be together, you guys do you know, exercises, you're working one-on-one -on -one together, you're working in small groups, we're coming out to learn a little bit. You don't, I don't talk this much. But here's how you're, you're going to know if this is for you. You really want a vehicle that provides you a way for your genius, for your wisdom, for your vision to come alive and be shared with others. You're ready to step into a community. And like that's one of the best things people talk about. They love the community. I've gotten to see so many people continue their connections way beyond our class. And that you also want to be, that, that your creative process will be tended with care and respect no matter where you are in your process, and that matters to you. You also know that you're in the right place if you're ready to engage the tools that will bring you fully alive. You're like, yes, I want to live fully alive through these wild times. And that you really want to understand how to use this ancient healing tool to be used as a tool for healing and transformation in your life and in the lives of others. 
And so if that's you, then we are in the right place. You know, and that um, I love to play with people. It's one of my favorite things to do on the planet. So what I'll give you right now is I want to make sure that you've got this link because this is kind of your, your way in is to make sure that you, um, when you sign up, I get to understand a little bit who you are and we do a discovery session and then I, and then we can actually have some time to talk and see if this is really the right program for you or not. And what I want to leave you with is just this simple prayer. I pray that your life force is liberated. Your life force is liberated. That you can and do find all the ways to remove all the blocks and barriers that are stuck within you. And that you know how to move and transform the barriers that are outside of you. And I pray that you wield the power of story with heart, with soul, with good ethics, with bravery, and that you know that you can do wonderful things with that power and to feel strong in that power and that you know how valuable you are and that your life is a gift and it's not to be wasted. And that when you tell your stories, when you tell your stories, you can bring healing to yourself and to the world around you for probably more time than we can even imagine. So that, that is our journey today. If you just didn't get enough and you're like, oh my God, but I want to do more, um, you can do more. <laughs> I'll even give you a little assignment to play with. And um, this, this is, you know, if you're just like, oh, I just, I want to keep playing with changing my story right now. You can do that. I'm going to give you this little assignment. It's going to give you something to play with. Um, I'll also tell you that everyone who registers this week, you get that discount, but you also get access to um, three more live classes that are happening between now and when we begin. And we're taking on the story, the story of love already happened. We're taking on the story of healing, the story of um, purpose, and the story of money. Why play small? So you're going to learn about how to work with these stories in terms of how they're living in your life and how to change them. So that is our class for today. I hope that you go out change lots of great stories, heal lots of great stories, live a great story. And I'm going to turn off recording. If you have any questions, I can stay on for a little bit and answer them. And otherwise, I wish you all the best. And um, 